Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello, fellow Jungians, and welcome back to our podcast. Today, the three of us take on the idea of speaking truth. We're all familiar with the famous adage, speaking truth to power. But most of us don't know where the idea originated and the deep spiritual hope it initially carried. Most of us have never considered the essential differences between truth, facts, and reality, which creates so much confusion that we're often left without firm ground to stand on. Today, we'll reveal the ways that sometimes truth can be a Trojan horse filled with hostility, how facts are weaponized when infused with the spirit of accusation, how psychological insight can link us with inner truth even if it initially makes us sick to hear it, and how truth acts so differently in the Cassandra complex and the scapegoat complex. At the end, we analyze a dream submitted by a listener that exposes the power of the archetypal death mother and a final image of hope to move beyond it. So I think taking on this topic of speaking truth evokes an enormous social context that has gotten a lot of steam. This Mm. fantasy around speaking truth to power. And I think many people don't really know where that came from, and there's been a real concept creep about that. I think there's much we can say about the difference between truth and facts. I think mm-hmm. there's much we can say about speaking truth as a kind of Trojan horse, that under the guise of speaking truth, people can deliver cruelty, they can deliver all kinds of antisocial impulses, and it's masked with, well, I'm just somebody who likes to tell the truth. Mm-hmm. So I, I thought I would just start right. with that phrase, speaking truth to power. And just because I think most people don't realize it, that that phrase was popularized by the Quakers. And part of the great mission of speaking truth to power in its origination was a plea for peace, but not for interpersonal or social conflict that the Quakers um, had traditionally been uh, conscientious objectors uh, when they were drafted often in uh, Korea, Mm -hmm. uh, Vietnam, they would go and volunteer um, to work in the medical uh, environment. They would courageously go and drag wounded soldiers off of the fields. They would not carry a gun as part of their holding to their own sense of values and truth. Mm. But somewhere Mm. around 1955, they published their first pamphlet where they specifically said, speak truth to power, Quaker search for an alternative to violence. And, Mm. And this hope that speaking to power was not going to frighten people in power, but was going to open their hearts because the truth that they were hoping to deliver was, for them, the truth of compassion, the truth of forgiveness, the truth that human beings can exist in a, in a kind of peaceful yeah. discourse. And it was not designed to, to tear politicians um, apart or destroy people's reputations. It was to try to open something Because the fantasy of higher Mm. truth is that higher truth has a corrective, medicinal, and healing potential. Now, one could argue whether or not that worked, but the spirit (laughs) of it 
lets us know something about the delivery. Because the information that we wish someone to take hold of and the spirit that is infusing what is said makes all the difference, I think. Well, I I didn't know that uh, that that was the, sort of the backstory behind that phrase, and what I find moving uh, about it is the spirit of kindness, uh, a spirit of of a kind of reconciliation, a gentleness, uh, the compassion that you talked about, and. Um, I'm thinking about how now it has become somewhat weaponized of, well, I'm going to, you know, tell these authorities this for their own good. Um, they need to know. Uh, and, and is that, is that truth or is that, uh, like a Trojan horse it looks good on the outside. It purports to be something that it's not. Uh, but that inside, it's really a vehicle for uh, competition or aggression or uh, dominating, winning. Well, and I think we're right into the obvious question that gets begged as you know, as soon as we bring up this topic is, what is truth? And how do you know what truth is? And so adding to what you guys were just saying, I mean, I think that the belief that we have truth Mm. is a kind of inflation. So anytime you think that you have the truth, whether that's Mm -hmm. a religious truth or uh, a political truth or or even an interpersonal truth, Mm -hmm. there's some inflation around that. And I think that if you, you know, you can, you can lean into that and go very, very far, and then you become a proselytizer and a zealot. Um, but, but I think we always have to be a little bit cautious about believing that we have the truth. And this, this phrase comes to mind, uh, which I appreciate, of intellectual humility, which, which means almost kind of cultivating doubt. Uh, you know, there, there's some lovely um, balancing point between letting ourselves know what we know mm-hmm. and being able to share that uh, in, in, a, in a way that is meaningful, not deny what we know, but at the same time, always hold it a little lightly so that mm-hmm. we're ready to be corrected or have our minds changed somehow or or open to new input. Well, I think um, even even that shift of attitude is I think wonderful to to step back and create some s- space between stimulus and response, frankly. Mm. That you know, I I'm, I'm sure that That's... this is the truth and it's mobilized in me and I want to you know send that truth out across the dinner table to Aunt Betty who always you know gets my goat or to the politician <laughs> or the school board or a spouse um so it's such there's lots of truths right there's lots of facts that we know but not all of them um become a kind of screaming missile that's moving across time and space mm-hmm. so just what you're saying, Lisa, to step back and, and regard the plan, you know, the plan of mm-hmm. attack by truth, and be able to ask, what's, yes. what's the fuel yeah. in this missile? Even if the, even if the missile is correct, you know, uh, Aunt Betty talks too much. And, you know, that's a fact. <laughs> but what's, mm-hmm. what's fueling the missile is that I'm an introvert, and, you know, I just can't stand that people don't shut their mouths once in a while and just breathe or maybe the content of what aunt betty says is so upsetting <laughs> yeah. to me subjectively because i've got an issue about the topic that's the fuel but it's going to come across the room like you always talk all yeah. the time and over thanksgiving 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a very benign example. I, there are much more heated things that happen. If I get fired across a holiday dinner table than that. There, and out in the collective of yeah. people, you know, writing in, firing things, uh, uh, tweeting, I don't know what it's called these days. Um, <laughs> Xing. Xing. But I Xing. like, you know, if we're the fuel in the missile, that purports to be uh, truth, um, but it's attacking. And I, I like uh, what you were saying, Lisa, about holding it lightly. And Joseph, uh, what you said uh, about the taking a pause between the stimulus and the reaction uh, or response. And what I would, the lens I would add to this is of what are you feeling? As if you're feeling activated, annoyed, frustrated, angry, um, impatient, a hundred other things, then you're not holding it lightly. <laughs> and you might need to take a little more time between what happened and how or if you're going to respond. Uh, is it really necessary to snap at Aunt Betty? Does that help her? Does it help the interaction around this uh, purported Thanksgiving table, let's say? Does it help you? Uh, so I'm also opening up the, you know, what I need to do because I'm activated versus do I really want this to land with, with Aunt Betty? Uh, do I want to affect her? How do I want to really impact her? And then in that case, what might be a more empathic or even just strategic uh, comment or intervention of, you know, oh, Aunt Betty, you know, uh, come in here into the kitchen with me for, you know, <laughs> get her away from the table for a minute. In a, in a, in a, but, you know, are we really in choice? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. When we, when we speak the truth. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. you know, I, I want to pick up on the Aunt Betty example here because, um, <laughs> Joseph, you mentioned facts. And I, I think there is kind of a difference between the facts and truth because facts are, well, first of all, you know, very fungible. <laughs> facts are fungible. But right. um, they also are, are context dependent. And the, the, the fact that Betty talks too much is actually an opinion, right? It might be mm -hmm. our truth, but it, there isn't maybe an absolute truth on that. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about sort of applying this to collective problems. And uh, I'll, pick on, I'll pick up something that is very controversial and about which I know very little, because um, mm -hmm. that is probably an easier place for me to go in some ways. But let's look at um, immigration. So there are very strong feelings about it. They tend to be very polarized. But my guess is that if you really dug down into it, if you read lots of um, good quality writing on it from across the political spectrum, if you went down to our th southern border and um, spoke to migrants coming across and spoke to border guards, if you talked to the um, social services people in the cities, that are providing services for the new immigrants. If you, if you really did a deep dive, you might find something, mm. I think, approaching truth. And it would be oh. very layered and complex, and it would be hard yes. to summarize it in just a few words. Well, maybe not. Maybe you, could, maybe you could summarize it in a sentence or two, but it would be a sentence or two with just a lot of, of, of information and I want to say kind of deep listening yes. uh, behind it. Um, yeah. uh, so so I, I believe that in many of these complex topics that plague our collective today, that, that you can find something like truth, but it requires an open mind um, and a lot of deep research and a, and a willingness sometimes to have your mind changed. Um, but, but it's not easy to find. And I think one of the great problems, actually, that concerns me greatly is that in the collective today, 
we don't have a kind of arbiter of truth. So I don't know, 30 or 40 years ago, it used to be that we basically felt that the mainstream media, you know, the CBS, NBC, and ABC, <laughs> because before the age of, you know, the 24-hour news cycle, you know, Walter Cronkite was the most trusted man in America. And you, you basically mm -hmm. got more or less the same story, no matter where you went. And there was an effort to cover, you know, all sides of, uh, of, of something. Now, I'm not saying that that meant that, uh, that these reports were truthful, but I do think that as a collective in the United States, say, we all felt like we basically knew what the truth was. We might have different opinions about what was going on, let's say, in Vietnam, but I don't think that there were wildly different versions of what we understood to be true. And of course, what we did understand to be true was to some extent doctored and covered up, and now we know more. Yeah. But, but the sacrifice of that kind of collective sense of at least we're all dealing with the same facts, I think is, um, I think it's a little dangerous. It worries me. So I'm, yeah. I kind of went off there, but. Uh, I, I'm really um, thinking about how we create narratives. We're meaning makers. We're storytellers. We take what we observe sense in any way and make meaning out of it. So it's always a narrative uh, or almost always. <laughs> and um, we, we just have to string things together. And I'm thinking about how, you know, sometimes they uh, do these experiments where they have a bunch of people witness the same thing. And uh, people saw different things. Uh, uh, and whether we have or have lost, as a collective, uh, a sense of a common narrative that, you know, maybe most people in America agreed that Walter Cronkite could be trusted. Um, and how much do we infuse narratives with our own subjectivity, passions, beliefs, claims to moral authority, <laughs> et cetera? Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, I, I found myself thinking about that that Kurosawa film Rashomon. You know, where like the same event gets told from all these different ways, and it's like yes. totally different. Yeah. And maybe what we had with you know in the age of Walter Cronkite is we had someone telling us this is the version, this is the correct version. And although it may not have always been true, it it had this utility that we that we all thought you know we all kind of had the same, we all had the same truth, I guess. I mean, I, I think maybe what we're saying is, you know, sort of this, this bedeviling question, what is truth and is it ever really knowable or discoverable about sort of an, I mean, there's different kinds of truth. Like, we, like there's like a religious truth. That's something totally different, but just even truth in terms of like world events that we might all need to comment on or have an opinion on. I mean, I mean there's just been such fraying around that in recent decades to, to a somewhat alarming degree, I think. And I think this is part of the, the, the influence of social media that um, we're going to have to contend with as a species is, um, you know, what, what it's done to truth, even while acknowledging that truth itself is slippery. Mm -hmm. Multiple realities. I find us um, going back and forth, uh, not necessarily saying it explicitly, in this dance between truth and fact. So maybe we can go back to that and toy with, with that a little bit. Sometimes they overlap and sometimes they don't. So just in terms of defining, uh, facts, generally speaking, are about an objective reality. Uh, there's statements, there's uh, an attempt to be objective, but also they are verifiable. Not all things that people say are truth can necessarily be verifiable and that they can be mm -hmm. proven as true or false if there is enough logical or empirical evidence that's provided. 
uh, facts tend to be uh, specific and concrete. Um, they're related to very specific details mm -hmm. or data points. Often, and this is very important in terms of uh, this movement from the Age of Enlightenment, where this, this separation of uh, truth and fact was, was a central tenet of the Age of Enlightenment, is that facts are independent from beliefs. That whether or not someone believes in a particular fact does not change it. People can believe or not believe in gravity, <laughs> and yet gravity is still verifiable. And that facts can be uh, empirically verified, that uh, many people can observe them consistently, can be experimented with, and it is uh, consistent uh, in itself. And this is very much part of the world of scientific inquiry. And, and there's even a, a different etymology. The etymology of the word fact is different from the etymology of the word truth, although we do get them mixed up um, in our culture, which is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. That in Latin, the word fact comes from factum, uh, which means a thing done or performed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so consequently, it is the concreteness of, of it. Uh, and we get the word uh, factory from the Latin factum, because it's a place where things are done and they are manufactured and they are objects that are put together and something comes out at the end. And it doesn't require any belief or fantasy or subjectivity. Mm -hmm. It's a factum. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think that's a generally a considered idea about what a fact is. A truth, um, the etymology of the word truth apparently comes from um, Old English and even Norse uh, language, uh, and it means faithful or trustworthy or or that you know, the speaker I, is honest. Yeah. Yeah, I, I looked up the etymology too, Joseph, and I found um, much what you said. And I think, you know, one of the other words, you know, faith, faithfulness, fidelity, loyalty, veracity, pledge, covenant, good faith. And I thought, you know, yes, that somehow um, it, requires, it requires a bit of faith to find the truth. Because as you're you're making this excellent point that it's it isn't the same as a fact, and there is an element of faith in it, mm -hmm. and that um, it my sense of reading it was that it has much to do with the speaker that that the mm -hmm. the speaker has a relationship to the listener, and that perhaps there's an implication that. The speaker of truth has a certain uh, commitment to the well-being of the person who is listening. So, you know, someone may may, may come. Uh, let's say, you know, it's the 1600s. You know, and a doctor who is full of goodwill says, mm -hmm. you know, the truth is that you have, you know, this bileless humor. And you know we're going to we're going to put leeches on you, and if that doesn't work, we'll do a bit of bleeding. Um, and that in the well, but seriously, you know, like in the doctor's yeah, I know. Chart, it's, a, I know. It's, a, it's a great right. There is it's a, a great faith. Point. There is an absolute alignment with healing, with hope, uh, with with the well being of the person that they're speaking to, and that because the other person feels hopefully feels held in the goodwill and the beneficent attitude of the physician that mm -hmm. like well well okay um where the age of enlightenment was so helpful to all of us is that when this was subject subjected to an empirical fact-based analysis uh, we don't know whether people really got much better uh, unless they had some kind of a hematocrit excess problem in the blood, that it may not have been helpful <laughs> at all to people. But um, 
<laughs> so factually, it was a real problem. But in terms of the faithfulness and the beneficent intention, there was mm -hmm. truth in it, rightly so. Um, yes. Yeah. And I think it's a great differentiation. Yes. So truth is often sub, uh, involves a subjective interpretation. And it often has a more mm -hmm. philosophical lens to it, and it, it, uh, it involves a personal, often moral and existential understandings. It has to do with interpretations of life and reality, which goes dead to what you were saying about the narrative. It often has a more abstract and broader uh, lens to it. Um, you know, like a statement like, freedom is essential to human flourishing. And that will be taken mm -hmm, as a mm -hmm. truth. And, but it is a philosophy, and it has an ethical context That's, that is a narrative yeah. that sits well with us. What, what I'm uh, thinking about now goes back to what you said at the beginning, Joseph, about the Quakers and uh, the compassion with which that phrase, speaking truth to power, was infused. And then, uh, you know, the, the, the associations with uh, the root meaning of, of truth, of, of goodwill and faithfulness and so on. So there's a relational component to truth. Uh, I, I may have my own truth about whether uh, I believe something or hold to some value. But when I put it out to other people or an other person, uh, where am I in that relationship? Uh, am I taking into consideration what my own inner state is, that it's a, a basic uh, state of a kind of kind neutrality and an awareness of how I may impact the other, uh, and then how do I frame it? And uh, it's a reiteration of what, what I said before, but um, I'm thinking about what we have internally between us and us, <laughs> so to speak, and then what we do interactionally and relationally. And I think that's where what purports to be truth gets to be pretty sticky is we think we have to put it out there and communicate it, uh, whether it's our mythical Aunt Betty um, or, or something on social media, and that we lose sight of the fact that there's a relationship. Well, I think part of the problem with social media is there is no relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, I agree, and yeah. yet, and yet there is, and that some you know public figures that have been excoriated mm -hmm. and hounded and and criticized, uh, somewhere out there there is that public yeah. figure. There, there's a real world effect. Exactly. Oh, can you imagine what the effect on this public person might be to have hundreds or even thousands of people uh, righteously mm -hmm. proclaiming the truth about him or her. Mm -hmm. And it impacts them. Yep. So I, I, I want to maybe flip what you've said a little bit, Deb, and just poke into kind of almost the opposite place, because I'm, I'm also thinking about uh, the subject of truth for me as I was considering this topic this week, really, uh, made me think about what we do as therapists mm -hmm. because in some sense truth is essential to the project of psychotherapy mm -hmm. and and there's a question about uh finding the truth finding the truth for the client and that part of what we do hopefully is create a space in which that can be um queried you know, what mm. is the truth for this person? And I, I do think that that could be a way of describing a, a, a large part of what we do in therapy is kind of 
hunting around for that person's truth. But, but then there's also a, a slightly more specific way I think that truth comes up and uh, something I've just been thinking about. Uh, someone, someone the other day shared with me a quote, and I wish I could give it attribution, but I, I don't have all the chapter and verse on it. But it was, it was lovely. He's talking about psychotherapy. The, the person said that psychotherapy cures by truth. <clears throat> it is a truth cure. Because it is where you confront the truth about yourself that you may have been defending against. Mm-hmm. And in that sense, part of what the therapist or the analyst does is reflect back a truth to the person. So if we as the therapist are afraid to share a truth that we know about the person, then we are arguably not very helpful to that person. And I'm, I'm going to use a somewhat extreme example, which is loosely based on a very old case, but I'm fictionalizing it massively. But this is, you know, would have been something that happened decades ago oh. anyway. So I had a client who was, um, uh, you know, sort of a middle-aged uh, man, and, and he smelt. He didn't shower, apparently, or do laundry very often, and this, it, wasn't, it wasn't a little smell. It was, it was deeply, deeply pungent. And, you know, you, you, you knew when he walked into the clinic because um, you could, I mean, from the time he opened the door, the kind of the whole, it was a relatively small clinic and the whole place smelled. I knew before I opened my office door that he would be sitting in the waiting room because I could smell him. And um, he was, you know, not, as you might imagine, not a very high functioning person, but he was looking for work. Um, he was hoping to work, you know, in a, in the, in a kind of service job. And he was a little confused as to why he was not very appealing to potential em- employers. And so I had this dilemma, did I deliver this truth to him? You know, Karen Moroda writes about this in one of her books. She says that as adults, you know, kids tend to give each other very um, crude feedback, like, oh, you're bossy or you smell or whatever. <laughs> but we stop doing that at some point. You know, we, we develop kind of social graces <clears throat> and then we don't share that kind of feedback with one another. So we will sometimes get people in our practices, and, and this is an extreme example that I'm using with this guy, but there, there are other times too. We, we see maybe something that someone is doing interpersonally because it's happening with us, let's say. Let's say we have a client who comes in and we can't get a word in edgewise. And then this person is uh, dismayed because their personal life is not going well and they don't have a lot of friends. And we're sitting over in our chair thinking, I know, you know, but do we, do we share that with them? And what Moroda says is that the consulting room is one of the few places where we can get this kind of very basic real life feedback on how we are coming across to other people. And that it really is the analyst's job to find a way to deliver that. So back to my hypothetical case about the, the, about the man who, who didn't smell very good. You know, it, it was very difficult for me to bring this up. Um, and I, it felt like information that would be genuinely useful to this person. Not only would it be useful to this person, but it did matter to me. Because it was difficult to mm-hmm. sit with him in a closed space for 50 minutes. So um, I'm thinking about, you know, we've been talking about how sharing truth can be, uh, we can turn that into a kind of a weapon. But, but I also want to say that we don't do ourselves or each other any favors when we hold back too much either. Hello, I want to take just a minute of your time to let you know some other ways that you can engage with us and support the podcast. We have a live event coming up. It's our first live podcast on February 10th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. It's a free event. You can come to the podcast and we'll take questions. We'll interpret a person's dream who's at the event. You'll have a chance to submit your dream there. So bring your dreams. And you can reserve your free ticket just by visiting our website. You'll see a banner at the top. 
It's really helpful if you like us, uh, if you follow us, if you write us a review on Apple Podcasts or other platforms. We also have a mailing list. We send out a monthly email newsletter, and you can sign up for that on our uh, website as well, thisunionlife.com. And you can also become our patron. Just go to the podcast page on our website, and you'll see how to sign up for that for a small donation. Each month, you get bonus content such as uh, your dream interpreted or um, uh, special Q&A episodes as well. And finally, we hope that you'll check out Dream School. It's our 12-month a course that teaches you how to work with your dreams, just like we work with dreams on the podcast. And it would be great to see you there. So thank you so much. I think that um, really beautifully, Lisa, you brought up two domains. And I'm going to keep using this metaphor of truth and fact, because I think it's so helpful to me. So there are times when, as an analyst, we can be factful. And factful mm-hmm. information um, helps, ideally helps the client orient to what is in the outer world, which includes other people, the other person of the yes. analyst. So to be said, um, um, mm. excuse me, but uh, I've been suffering greatly. It seems that you're not bathing before you come to the session. It's distracting, makes it difficult for me to concentrate. I'm concerned about other people's experience that come into the office afterwards. I'm concerned about your health, for that matter, that there are consequences to not being hygienic. Um, So, and what is your relationship to this information? Um, Truth, from a psychoanalytic standpoint, I think has more to do with linking the ego to lost information in the unconscious. So, so much of what ideally the interpretation is that, oh, well, uh, you, are, you are concerned about, well, you're concerned about your, um, uh, I'm trying to, I want to stay with this metaphor of the person who is unwashed. So the psychoanalytic mm-hmm. interpretation could be, and I have done this actually, is to say, you know, so-and-so, um, I'm thinking about the fact that your um, mom um, decided to leave the home when everybody was very, very young, that you and your siblings wound up actually raising each other as dad was, you know, at work all the time. One of the things that we learn from our mothers are how to bathe, how to brush our teeth. Um, Many of us later in life have memories. Like, you, know, you don't leave the house without brushing your teeth or brushing your hair or you take a shower every morning. And so what I'm suspecting is that when you look inside yourself, that there is a blank space, that there is not a figure that says, you know, sweetheart, you have to take a shower before you go to school. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no way out of it. You have to do that. Yeah. And so because there is that lacuna, that means that you and I, need to sit down and make a plan as if you had a really wonderful mother giving you good advice in there. And here's some things that we can think about. So that could be a kind of psychoanalytic truth. There's something missing in the unconscious, and it requires knowledge and an understanding of that. And there are also facts about the implications of this in the outer world. Of course, there are other examples of things that are split off in the unconscious, which are, I think, a little more dramatic than what I was saying, or more difficult Mm -hmm. to bring forward. But from a psychoanalytic standpoint, truth is that uh, the fullness of the experience has not been splintered, and falseness is the partiality of the experience, the splitting of the experience, which then leaves us confused. I think that's what... Mm. We're, we're kind of saying. I don't know if that, if that mm. stands muster for you guys. I, I'm thinking about, uh, to, to complicate things uh, even more than they already are, yeah, uh, the difference, or is there a difference <laughs> between truth and uh, reality? Mm-hmm. A- and... Uh, 
the difference between you know this this client who uh, was unhygienic. Mm-hmm. Um, is there a truth about that? Might be about the lack of an internal good enough mother uh, that has become internalized and uh, and says to this person, "Take care of yourself. Uh, you are important." Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how your hair looks and whether your clothes are clean matters because you matter. Um, That might be a truth. Um, And then there's the reality, which is this person's body odor is impacting the therapist. And one might, by extension, well imagine, you know, all kinds of other people with whom he came in contact. So, including prospective employers. And that the reality, um, as there's a science fiction writer, Philip Dick, who says reality is that which, even if you don't believe in it, doesn't go away. And, and so I'm thinking, here's a reality that needs mm-hmm. to be, that simply needs to be addressed, stated, recognized, acknowledged. Uh, this is the what is. And of course, there's a subjectivity to it, that mm-hmm. if I were the therapist, I would be affected. That matters too. So again, there's that relational component of how do we impact each other. Uh, you know, um, there's this um, phrase that comes up for me a lot about uh, letting ourselves know what we know. And I think it <laughs> probably comes up for me because I think throughout my life, I've struggled with that sometimes, you know, where I've known something. Mm-hmm. And then I let myself not know it because it's inconvenient to know it somehow. It's going to make someone else uncomfortable or I'm going to have to make a change. And, and so, again, this is another thing that sometimes we do in therapy mm-hmm. is that we help someone know what they know. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Mark Winborn, our, our colleague and, uh, you know, our, our teacher, um, has a book, we'll put it in the book list. And uh, it's a book on interpretation, and and there's this this part in it that I really like, where he he talks about supervising relatively new therapists, and he'll say to them sometimes as they're going through a session, "What did you know at this point in the session?" And when he asks the question that way, the supervisee will be able to say, "Well, you know, I knew." Th- I'm making this up. I knew that he was really angry, but wasn't in touch with his anger. And then Mark will say, well, why didn't you say that? And I, and I love yeah. that thought that at any moment we could sort of say, what do I know right now? You know, and tying it to what you said, Deb, what is the truth at this moment? What is the truth that I have in my hand? What is the reality? Uh-huh. And, and then can you let yourself hold on to it? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, really it goes, I'm going back to what you said before, Lisa, about holding it lightly, that in the consulting room, you know, as a therapist, um, I, might, I might know any, I know how I feel. I know that this person has body odor. Mm-hmm. I know these things, but I'm holding it, I hope I'm holding it lightly, and that my intention uh, it is for the client. Uh, this mm-hmm. is uh, something that if I reflect on it or provide some information that I hope he or she will be able to use. But let me take it outside the, the consulting room for a minute, because let's say there's a very similar dynamic interpersonally. Let's say that, um, okay. that one person always finds herself accommodating herself, let's say to her partner. And at some level, she knows this. She knows that her partner is being boorish or unkind or, or, you know, kind of routinely Mm -hmm. cruel. Mm -hmm. And she keeps on not letting herself know that. And we could flip the sexes. This happens in, you know, both directions. And, and she just sort of kind of lets it continue. And at what point do you at what point do you share your truth? And I, I agree with you. I mean, you want the other person to be able to use it, but sometimes it is a matter of protecting yourself. And that, frankly, yeah. might be with a client. I mean, sometimes clients treat their therapist terribly. 
And it, it might be very important to share the truth of your emotional experience with someone, yes, either in the consulting room or interpersonally. And the hope is that it would influence the system positively, mm -hmm. that the other person might be able to make use of it, but that it would also allow a more authentic relationship. Mm -hmm. Even if it's wounding. I mean, I'm, I'm saying this because this is an incredibly difficult thing for me to do, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, again, this, uh, that words are, all words are Trojan horses. And, <laughs> and so the spirit that infuses what is spoken has an enormous um, influence on the likely effect that it may have when it comes to the ego of the other person. Because we could have 10 people say the exact same sentence, and one person is delivering it as an accusation, another person is delivering it out of a sense of vicarious shame on behalf of the person, and another is seeking to improve their, the adaptation of the person. Somebody else thinks of it in a different way. So depending on the spirit that comes with it or is delivered through the words influences very much how the psyche is going to experience it. And that goes much to Jung's saying that there is an ego-to-ego -ego communication, but there's also mm -hmm. an ego-to-unconscious communication, that our words also are speaking something quite different to the unconscious of the other person. So if there is a, a intent to heal and intent to help or an intent to make room for the self which is which is a whole other question to subject things to really influences how the information is going to be likely received and metabolized by the other person i'd like to say that um, the idea of knowing something has to do with it coming into the perception of the ego mm -hmm. that um, just as you were saying with uh, this supervision experience, that there's a dialogue happening, a dialectic happening yeah. in the analytic session, and something comes into awareness for the analyst, which strikes them as relevant and strikes them perhaps as factual, but it has to be subjected also to the sense of uh, what is the likely effect, the utility of, of this speaking this or putting it in the session, how might it facilitate or not the healing process? But I do take uh, what you're saying, Lisa, that there are all kinds of realities in the universe, by the way. And reality is often the word we use for almost cosmic reality. I mean, there are things that are happening in certain parts of mm -hmm. the galaxy which are real. They're happening, but they're not in the realm of knowledge in as much as I have no perception of them. I, I have no relationship to, to any number of realities. And of course, reality also has to do with various frames. Our, our friends that are quantum physicists tell us, you're not perceiving reality at all. That actually color mm -hmm. doesn't actually exist yeah. in the universe. Mm -hmm. That human beings just make that up. Joseph, do something. you have friends who are quantum physicists? <laughs> uh, I have friends that like to talk about it. Uh, that um, <laughs> light, light tickles your eyes, which tickles these brain center. Mm -hmm. And then we decide that, oh, these various stimuli look like red and blue and pink. But nothing other than human brains and eyeballs report color. Uh, so in a w way, it... There are other realities within which, you know, we're just we're just adding subjectivity yeah. into the great mix of things. Sure. So right. reality, facts, truth, and knowledge, or the knowing of something, I think it's so important that we don't mush them all together. It's important for us, but also I think it's important for other people because they need to ask themselves these questions of differentiation. What I might notice is. I want to verbalize this sentence, and I want to verbalize it in the direction of that person over there. Mm -hmm. Is this about facts? 
Is it about subjective truth? Is this something that just came into my, my knowing? Do I actually believe that I have some revelation about ultimate reality? And what is the effect that I am hoping for in, this, in the psyche and in the responsiveness of the other person? That just that space between stimulus and response, and to ask those questions, what is truth? What's reality? What's knowledge? What are facts? What is my intent? The time to just run through those questions would have, I think, an enormous positive impact on what is finally delivered and how it's delivered and why, the understanding around it. Yeah. We're, and we're exploring these differentiations. Okay. Yeah. So that requires consciousness you know just as you said you know we to know something means that it's in consciousness it's in our awareness right and uh, all of those dimensions facets if you will of where am i coming from what's a fact what's this what's that requires that that we as uh speakers be conscious of what we're feeling, what our intent is, how do we deliver the message, uh, and that's in the relational realm. But then there's also the realm you were talking about, Lisa, of you know how do we know something that we haven't really wanted to let ourselves know? Mm -hmm. how, how do we talk to ourselves about... Uh, this or that or the other thing, which is a huge part of what psychotherapy can do, is to help somebody really know uh, their their own truth mm -hmm. um, about you know a bad habit or um, substance usage or a persistent relational dynamic that goes on everywhere that this person goes. So, you know, how, how do I become uh, more, more aware of what's, what's going on between me and me? Yeah. Uh, it's a lot. It's, it, this is a really is. big task. Uh, it's a lifelong task uh, f for all of us a and goes exactly to what Jung was talking about, that our task is to hold as much consciousness as we possibly can. And, and related to that, Deb, and also what you were saying before, Joseph, you know, there's this um, truth that we often, truth that we often share with people uh -huh. in therapy, that there's what happens, and then there's the story you tell yourself about it. And Deb, yes. this goes to the desire to create a narrative. So... Let's yeah. say that uh, we're supposed to meet a friend for lunch and she calls and cancels last minute. And that's what happened. That's just the fact. That's the truth. But we make up a story about that either, oh, I guess my friend was just really busy today or she doesn't like me or, you know, that bitch, she always does this to me, whatever it is. But we create yeah. a story and you can really watch yourself do this. I mean, if you, if you set an intention for yourself, to notice the stories that you tell yourself about interactions, and this kind of goes to cognitive behavioral therapy, you can really see yourself creating narratives, some of which can be comforting, mm -hmm. like, oh, I guess my friend was just really busy, and some of which can really generate distress. She must really not like me. And, and so you, you do have to kind of pay attention to the stories that you generate, and this this makes me think of um, the work by Byron Katie, if you're familiar with her. She has these four questions that it's, um, she invites you to ask when you have a kind of upsetting uh, interpersonal issue or you're working on something. And the first question is, is it true? And the second question is, can you absolutely know that it's true? So mm -hmm. if your friend canceled lunch, you know, and you assume it's because she's unhappy with you, well, is it true? It's like, well, I know I think it's really true. Well, can you really know it's true? No, no, I can't unless I ask her, you know. So, so um, 
you know, I, I think it's it's interesting that what we feel is often taken to be true, right? We assume yes. our feelings are true. And our feelings are, are important, but they are not always true. So it's a, it's, there's something about relating to our emotions, taking them seriously, giving ourselves space to have them, but not assuming that they are true. So again, to go back to this silly little example, if we're upset because our friend canceled lunch, okay, we have our feelings, but we can't assume that that means that our mm -hmm. story is true. And this is betrayed in language so frequently when people say, well, I feel like she didn't call me because she doesn't like me. But we're starting with a feeling, but we're actually ending the sentence with this kind of narrative belief structure. But it gets mm -hmm. all mushed and around. Actually, what I'm feeling is that I feel rejected. And I'd like to think about the feeling of being rejected and the history of being rejected. So, and my complex about being rejected, which lives in me, the fantasy <laughs> that this person's having an experience yeah. that motivated their behavior is totally different from my feelings. And of course, we Absolutely. mush these together. And I would all even say, Joseph. Mm -hmm. That when we start a sentence with, I feel like, mm -hmm. or I feel that, that's actually not a feeling. I feel exactly. like she was trying to insult me. That's actually a thought. Well, exactly. That's not a feeling. But and you can ask yourself, is that yes. true? Exactly. But the fact that we start with the yeah. word feeling suggests unconsciously that there is a feeling underneath it that is it's yes. a Trojan horse. Every time someone says, yeah. I feel, and then they state a thought, it's a Trojan horse. So there's a feeling hidden inside mm -hmm. of the thought, which is, you don't like me. Mm -hmm. Open mm -hmm. up the Trojan horse in the middle of the night, and all these soldiers come out, which attack your self-esteem at night, you know, and tell you that yes. you're mm -hmm. unloved, and no one ever loved you, and you, you, know, you don't look very good, and all these other things. And they climb back in the horse when you wake mm -hmm. up, and it still looks like it's about the other person not liking us. So uh, mm. it's a wonderful distinction. Feelings, feelings and feeling yeah. language is very different. It, it, it's one of the biggest uh, things I think we can probably all work on uh, is I, I do get to have my feeling of, my, of feeling hurt or feeling rejected, or just disappointed because of the last-minute lunch cancellation. And it's very hard to just uh, allow those feelings, especially rejection, shame, uh, sadness, left out, vulnerable. We don't like to feel those things. And so it's much easier to create the narrative, a thought about the other person uh, and how we're put upon or picked on or whatever it might be, uh, to put it out there rather than just saying, gosh, I, I was really looking forward to being with this person. And uh, I do have my self doubts, and um, you know, this is the third time this week that something's happened where I've felt not attended to, or not wanted, or blown off, or something. A and sit with ourselves about that, uh, rather than going to a narrative, mm -hmm. which then becomes the truth, and it's a projection. Right, that we are using the truth-telling as a way of throwing spaghetti mm -hmm. at the wall and seeing, you know, what sticks. <laughs> I, I do want to spend, uh, save some time um, to talk about two 
familiar complexes that that also um, have something to do with the idea of truth. And one is the scapegoat complex, and one is the Cassandra complex. And they're both rooted in kind of ancient uh, mythology as well as uh, ritual beliefs. So in the scapegoat complex, it's said to come from ancient traditions of ritualistically taking a goat, literally accusing the goat of the sins of all the people Mm -hmm. in the tribe, and then sacrificing the goat in one way or another, often driving it into the desert, or sometimes sacrificing it. Sometimes the goat would be accused, you know, you did this Mm -hmm. and this. So it's a way of expiating a kind of conflict inside of the tribe. The Cassandra complex comes from the Cassandra myth, where Apollo is wooing this beautiful woman, Cassandra, and offers her whatever she would like if, if she would only become his lover. And uh, she puts him off and puts him off, puts him off, and says, oh, fine, you know, give me the gift of prophecy. So he gives <laughs> her the gift of prophecy. Obviously, it doesn't kick in right away because she immediately says, you know, now that I have prophecy, I don't think I'm going to really be interested in being your lover. And then Apollo turns around and says, well, I can't take anything back, but I'm going to tell you that no one will ever believe you. Now, when Cassandra's mm-hmm. turning him down, I'm, I don't have the sense that her prophecy's kicked in yet because she's going to have a really difficult time. As we see, she sometimes floats in as an ancillary character in various uh, Greek dramas, where she liter- literally just comes on stage for a minute, says something, everybody disregards her, she shrugs and she walks off stage, and she's always telling exactly the truth about what's going on. Yeah. So, how this shows up in the culture, which I think is so important, is that people who, who have a scapegoat complex, um, and is really woven centrally into their character, have an innate curiosity in the pathologies of other people and in the pathologies of systems. Because inherent in the energy of the scapegoat is the seeking out of sin, the seeking out of what's wrong. Mm. Now, one could say that this is also every physician, in a sense, is seeking out what's wrong and then trying to identify Mm -hmm. it and address it. But Mm -hmm. scapegoats are often treated rather badly in their personal lives, while physicians Mm -hmm. often can be venerated, but both are looking for what's wrong. And here's the difference, Mm -hmm. is that the scapegoat discovers what's wrong, speaks it as an accusation. And there is a fantasy that accusing the person of what's wrong is somehow a solution. Accusing the system of what's wrong is a solution. Mm -hmm. And often the accusation is the end of the interaction. Once the other person Mm -hmm. receives the accusation and shows any sign of distress, then the archetype of the scapegoat has happened and something is now infused the other person and the scapegoater temporarily feels that they are um, have expiated something dark and they've also done something significantly helpful now often scapegoaters who are you know in our modern world are constantly accusing other people or systems and then find themselves alienated uh, they wind up mm-hmm. getting Fired from jobs, they wind up losing relationships with people who they care about. And part of the cognitive distortion is that the scapegoater believes that their accusations should be rewarded, which gives them this boldness in constantly accusing people of things that they perceive are incorrect and sometimes might even be quite truthfully assessed, you know? But it's the fact that the information, the identification of the problem becomes a Trojan horse, and inside the Trojan horse is this um, incredible accusation and the placing of all forms of 
the accusation, removing it from the person in the community and funneling it into the other person through the energy of accusation. And in most people's psyches and organizational psyches heartily resist that process of accusation. The physician, on the other hand, we want a physician to tell us what's wrong. We, we like pay them big bucks. I feel mm-hmm. terrible. I need, I want to be probed and scrutinized. I want to be told <laughs> what's wrong. And the physician says, well, here you go. This is wrong. But if a physician mm-hmm. accuses us of the diagnosis, we often will never see them again. Because that's, that's mm-hmm. not why we're here. Because the accu- accusing me of having cancer, let's say, that's not medicine. That, that's a Trojan horse. What, what, what is anyone supposed to do with that? We want the physician mm-hmm. to come with accurate information and then offer healing, offer solutions, offer right. resolution, offer right. care. The scapegoat almost never offers a solution, offers mm-hmm. care, never speaks what they have to say with compassion or a desire to even stay in the situation. Because often the truth, when it's an accusation, is, is mm-hmm. thrown and then the scapegoat wants to back off just the way the tribe would accuse the goat and then throw the goat out into the wilderness and run back to the camp. You, you don't want to be around anymore once the accusations have been laid. The doctor says, I'm sorry, this is the problem, and leans in, ideally holds, holds the person close to the healing process. Now, the Cassandra myth is a little different, and, and this is another difficult piece, is when somebody has a deep sense of what is wrong or what is true that has not been revealed, you know, the prophecy, mm-hmm. but something about the way that the information is conveyed is so inconsequential to the listener that it is disregarded. And the truth teller is then left in this state, often the state of helpless horror, as they watch the terrible uh, consequences unfold. And so there is, and something is broken in that complex where the truth telling of the individual is mm. it's interfered with in some way. And I don't know how to, I don't know that I fully understand the psychodynamics about how that Apollonic curse leaves Cassandra truth teller uh, void of any impact. And it may have something to do with the rejection of the self. Mm. That if, if we take away the, the social interpretation of Apollo wanting to date her, and we think of Apollo as the self, which many ancient worlds did, that the self comes to the ego and says, I wish to be close, and I will share my vast perceptions of you. And then Cassandra says, oh, that sounds great. I would like to harvest everything you're telling me, but that I don't want to be burdened in any way by the presence of the self. I would, it's more of a Promethean piece, you know. Give me all the facts, get out of town, get away, leave me alone. I'll do whatever I want to do with them. And then that disconnect from the deeper strata makes the truth seem ephemeral, perhaps. What I'm thinking about is um, in this uh, uh, duality here that you've proposed, that the scapegoat has to do with the past. Of uh, The accusation is about something that uh, some other person has done. Mm-hmm. Um, like in Lisa's uh, fictive example, the friend that cancels at the last minute for lunch. And that the Cassandra complex is about the future. Mm-hmm. And that uh, we... And, you know, that if you um, keep forgetting to fill the ga- car up with gas, uh, you're, you're going to be on, a, on the road somewhere and run out and you won't like it. And that it's, 
it's a sort of like, um, I, I don't believe I do that, or I don't believe that that's what will happen. I think I do really monitor the gas level, or I think I have enough gas to get to where I'm going, and then I'll fill it up. Uh, so there's a, a sort of um, a predictive quality that I can imagine uh, is very easy for a listener to deny. Uh, you know, if, it, if you don't turn the heat down on the stove, you're going to burn, you know, whatever's in the pot. No, I won't. Um, <laughs> it's but but I like the juxtaposition of of past and and future. I do too. I, mean, I, I think, think that's what great. they maybe both have in common. Uh, what they maybe both have in common is that there are different ways that we ask others to hold uncomfortable truths for us that we don't want to have to reckon with. Yes. And then we can reject the person who's holding the uncomfortable truth. Mm. Whether that relates to the past or the future. I think that, that that's really it nice. Really well. I think that's right of uh, we're asking someone else to hold an uncomfortable truth that is making us uncomfortable. Whose uncomfortable truth is it, really? I think that, that works really, really, really well. The last mm -hmm. bit I'll just quickly mm -hmm. toss we out. Solved and I, I, we solved it. Is um, which goes back to the <laughs> analytic, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the analytic piece, which well, we is solved truth. <laughs> um, is is the bivalence of, of quote unquote truth, and and this was such a wonderful thing that happened um, in early Jungian training that um, the Jung Institute was founded. Jung himself was very ambivalent about that occurring because he didn't want his ideas to become systematized, but it happened and it was going to happen. And he was involved with it, of course. Within a short amount of time, the training analysts began to report that um, the trainees would frequently have dreams that they were being bitten by serpents. Bitten by <laughs> snakes. And this happened so frequently that the training analysts began to feel like if you didn't have that dream, something was probably not happening correctly in the training process. And uh, someone came to Jung and said, You know, everybody's having these dreams. What is this about? <laughs> and Jung uh, apparently said in this sagacious way, He's like, Ah, oh, yes, yes, well, of course they are. You see, because <laughs> um, the <laughs> snake is a symbol of wisdom, but it is also the bringer of suffering and pain, as, as it is, at least in mythology. And so what's occurring is mm -hmm. that the wisdom around the nature of the unconscious, as well as the wisdom that is delivered in a correct interpretation, bites the ego and injects something into it, which at first makes the ego feel unwell. We often don't want to know things that we've been defending against. That's why we're defending against them. Right. The right. unwellness right. could be a flush of anger, a fever of anger, or a, a chill of, of fear, or a disorientation, a wooziness about who am I and what's, what's real around here. But the venom also facilitates a breaking down of the ego and then in the re-coagulation of the ego, the new information is then integrated, which is interesting because venom actually is the beginning of the digestion process of the serpent, that it paralyzes mm -hmm. the creature or maybe even kills them. But it also is full of enzymes that begin to break down all the tissue so that then when the snake gobbles it up, it can take it in. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the biting of the serpent is the interpretation, the wisdom, the information 
that both makes ego feel unwell begins to dissolve it and also brings it in contact with something about itself that is true subjectively that well, needs to be held onto and and just to take your metaphor a little further joseph maybe it is true sometimes that truth dissolves defenses and it can even dissolve our uh, a place maybe where our ego is too rigid so there can there can be a a real medicine in truth that, it, that us, if it's delivered in the right way or in the right time it dissolves right, our defenses and in the right dosage mm -hmm. which comes us brings us full circle to the intent of the Quakers in their publication of their pamphlet, mm -hmm. Speaking Truth mm -hmm. to Power, that it was not about accusation, and it was not about trying to injure someone, and it was not about virtue signaling. That the truth for them is that human beings should carry, for the Quakers, a Christ-like system of values of healing and forgiveness of unity, love, relationship, and that this communion of love extends to all humans, all people, regardless of borders or political or geopolitical conflict. And so the truth was the testimony of that field of compassion and for them Christian love and that was the truth that they wanted people in authority and power to hear, which brings us, mm -hmm. as you had said, to truth in service to wholeness and healing, whether it is political healing, mm -hmm. individual healing, wow. societal healing. And maybe mm -hmm. that's the real yeah. Yeah. purpose of truth. Yeah. Right. Hmm. And that might be time to switch to a dream. Today's dreamer is a woman. She's 42, and she's a theater practitioner and part-time theater professor. She's entitled her dream, What Can Be Saved? And here's the dream. I was walking around outside the home I grew up in, in East Tennessee. It had snowed and there had been a deep freeze. I came across a scarlet macaw that had frozen to death. I noticed the bright, brilliant red of its feathers against the white snow and ice, but it had clearly died of the cold. There was no life left in it. As I walked around, I found two more dead, frozen, scarlet macaws. I intuitively knew that due to climate change, their migration patterns had been disturbed in some way, and that's how they ended up in North America, so far from their homes. Then I came upon a patch of grass covered in snow where my mother was doing some sort of gardening or tending to the yard. Here I found a tiny baby scarlet macaw, also half frozen, but still alive. It was bright red like the adult birds I'd found, but moving around slightly. Like baby birds newly hatched, it was sort of ugly and desperate looking, but also so fragile, helpless, and lovable. I wanted to protect it and save it. I knew it would die if I didn't intervene but my mom was acting unfeeling and cold. Without words, she seemed to express that it was a pest and that it should be, just be ignored. I felt her unspoken message to me was that I should not see it, pretend I didn't see it, and also should not acknowledge its suffering or the Earth's changes that were causing these birds to go off course and die. For context, she says, I'm a mother of an almost five-year-old daughter. Since becoming a mom, I've been struggling with complicated feelings toward my own mother, wishing she could be more emotionally supportive, 
and also remembering times from my childhood of feeling unsupported or unseen. Sometimes she was very present, but other times checked out and conflict avoidant. I'm also starting to long for a second child, but I fear I'm too old to go through that journey of pregnancy and baby rearing again, and I worry I might have trouble conceiving this time around since my fertile days might be dwindling. (laughs) Professionally, I also feel stuck between continuing what I've been doing for 20 years or starting all over with something new. She says that the main feelings in the dream were deep grief for the dead birds and for the changing earth, love and affection for the baby bird, wanting to save it, but not being sure if I could or even if I had the right to intervene with forces of nature. I also felt sad about how, if I did save it, it would likely be a bird in captivity and would probably never be free. And she adds, The setting was outside of the home I grew up in in Tennessee. I often dream of this home, though my parents sold it a couple of years ago. In real life, this part of the country doesn't get much snow, but it just had its biggest snowstorm in 30 years. I live in Chicago now and accustomed to winter, but don't like it. Like many people, I worry about climate change and wrestle with the existential questions it brings up. I don't think I have strong associations with scarlet macaws, though I had a recent conversation with my daughter about how parents or parrots are able to speak human language. Okay, this is a lot. What do we make of it all? Well, it's it's one of those dreams that you have an immediate feeling reaction to. At least that yes. was true for me. You know the yes, the frozen birds in the snow, and of course, you know it's not uncommon to dream about animals in distress. That is a fairly common type of dream, and always very poignant. Um, so we can sort of uh, note that. And, and if you want to um, take a, de- a page from, from Deb's book, we could start right with the setting. She's outside the home she grew up in. So we're back right. in a sort of childhood complex. And it had snowed and there had been a deep freeze, which we associate with um, sort of a lack of feeling or kind of frozen feeling. There's a lack of emotional warmth. Yes. And then, of course, uh, there's the juxtaposition between the bright red and the uh, of the scarlet macaw and the frozen the ice the, the snow and ice yes. the white yes. so red is a color that's kind of associated with life force with vitality and uh, it, that exists here but it's it's in contrast to this this frozen environment yes and the frozen environment extends to the mother yes uh, where she says my mother was acting unfeeling and cold, which mm-hmm. really, um, you know, kind of highlights what you were saying about the significance of the cold and the snow. That the emotional tone here is is the cold that freezes the bright life of the scarlet macaws, who have somehow gone off course. Uh, that climate change cold in its broader sense, emotionally as well, an Mm -hmm. overall atmosphere of cold has caused these lovely, bright, uh, life, alive-looking birds to go off course in their lives, Mm -hmm. Um, except for the baby bird, who's kind of scrawny and ugly and its feathers haven't all come in, and um, it's it's lovable. Mm-hmm. And I'm connecting that with her uh, self query about and ambivalence about do I want another child, new life? Yeah, but I mean, I think it's very interesting. Of course, of course, the 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 big thing is the baby bird. Um, yes. And the question is, how does she relate to it? 
and she has the right impulse. She feels loving toward it. But there's this real question mark at the end of the dream. It's not at all clear what's going to happen. Is she going to ignore the baby bird or not? I don't, I don't know that we know. It's one of those dreams that doesn't have a really clear resolution. It's like it poses a question. What are you going to do with this? Are you going to ignore it or not? And of course, we would wonder, what are you ignoring in yourself? Or what are you in danger of ignoring? And uh, we could look at the mother in the dream as this might be commenting on her actual relationship with the outer mother. But of course, we could also see it as uh, this is how the mother complex functions in her psyche. It serves to cut her off from uh, an awareness. It goes back to what I was saying before about kind of not letting yourself know what you know, that there is this uh, vulnerable baby bird who needs needs tending. And, and there will be some compromise because if you pick it up and take care of it, it's going to be in captivity. But arguably, that's better than letting it freeze to death. I find myself thinking about the myth of Demeter, and uh, mm. particularly, I'm very struck by the winterscape, uh, the adult uh, dead macaws in the snow, and then there's an image of the mother tending a small patch of grass, but that's where the one living baby macaw is still alive, but barely and is, mm. is in yeah. the tiny patch that the mother is willing or capable of being interested in, even though it's still early winter. So um, mm -hmm. in the story of uh, Demeter and Persephone, is, Demeter is this goddess who brings the spring and the summer and the fruiting of things and the beauty of the natural world, fecundity, growth. Her child, young child Persephone is taken off into the underworld by Hades to be married without her permission and kept there. Demeter, being separated from her daughter, falls into a state of absolute and, and, and total um, despair and grief, and that the, the world falls into a, a kind of endless winter. Nothing grows, nothing fruits, nothing can survive. And finally, the gods who are invested in all of this, uh, try to broker a deal so that Persephone can at least at some points visit her mother. When Persephone does, the spring and the summer come beautifully alive, and when Persephone goes back mm -hmm. to the underworld to be a queen ostensibly, Demeter falls at least into just a season of uh, grief and wintering, but, but not an endless wintering. And so... Um, it begs a different question, a possible question about the mother, the biological mother, as well as the mother complex. Mm -hmm. Why is the mother caught in a wintering? The mother within her and the mother around her. And mm -hmm. is there mm -hmm. some trouble around this alienation of the mother and the child? Now, I, I would lean into this more in more as perhaps a dream about the mother's, the biological mother's psyche. That the mother archetype within her mother's psyche is caught in something of an endless winter because she is somehow alienated from the Persephone within her. That her biological mother has lost touch with her own core, core, her own youthful, ebullient, um, young, innocent self. Now, when there is some vestige of the young part of the mother is nearby, there is at least a patch of grass, but there is some interference in the way that the mother's psyche is structured such that she gives enough so that the baby is half alive. But the, what I would suggest is that the mother cannot delight in the return of Persephone. There is something 
something in that particular relationship of feeling the relief of the return of the child. And if I were to make that intrapsychic, I would say that the biological mother somehow is deeply ambivalent about her own inner child, her own capacity to embrace renewal, the springtime of things in herself. And it begs the question of, of why, why is that? Why is the mother's psyche caught in too much of a winter? And that even when the daughter returns, when the new life returns, new potential in all its forms for the biological mother, there is some, some way it cannot be tended properly. Mm-hmm. So thinking about this in a multi-generational way, that if the mother if the mother's psyche is interfered with so that her own birthing potential is caught ever in a wintering, that things are only allowed to grow a little bit before they are frozen, and they're frozen as the mother stays in this world of iterative labor. She's scratching at the frozen ground, getting a little patch of grass. Mm. How might that be passed onto the biological daughter? How is that alive intergenerationally? And that this dreamer may be invited to do a piece of intergenerational healing work. Mm-hmm. I, I want to take it in a slightly different direction. Sure. What, what I hear, and I'm kind of uh, interpolating here a little bit, is ambivalence. So it sounds like the mother was somewhat ambivalent, or at least that's how the dreamer experienced her. Sometimes she was very present, other times she was absent. And I suspect that this dreamer is somewhat ambivalent about her experience of mothering. Uh, because if you're if you're if you have a child relatively late, as this dreamer did, and you think you might want a second child, you kind of get on it right away. At least that was my experience. Um, you know, kind of whether or not I wanted, you know, whether or not I actually felt ready. It's like, well, it's time. We're going to do this before you know the window closes, and and that's okay. The streamer obviously didn't uh, didn't feel that way, but now she's starting to yearn for a second child. And she's not sure she's really, I mean, of course, there's a question about whether or not, you know, she would be able to conceive. But that aside, do I really want to do all that again? So yeah. there, there's ambivalence around mothering. And so I, I think the dream might be speaking to that in part. So I th- I'm seeing it more as a kind of intrapsychic dream. Um, I'm also uh, thinking about, will our dreamer, uh, be mothered herself as a mother. Uh, in the dream, the dream ego's mother is scratching away in the cold, uh, a little patch of earth, but there's snow all around. And, uh, and then there is the worry about, um, you know, the climate and, and mother earth. And are we, what's going on with climate change that causes these birds to go off course. So how is the mother also cared for and attended to and supported in the dream image of the mother doing the gardening and for our dreamer uh, having another child? Mothers need to be mothered uh by families and neighbors and their own mothers etc uh, and how do we support mothering and will she be supported i think all three of us are saying the same thing from different lenses archetypally <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, in terms okay. of inner object work outer object relations mm-hmm. so uh yes i think we're all landing on this how um, multifaceted mm-hmm. the the struggle is with uh, being a mother, the mother archetype, the intergenerational 
realities of this mm -hmm. uh, and and the mythology around all of it. The good news is, mm -hmm. generally speaking, when somebody begins to dream about a particular kind of problem, it's a signal from the self that the self thinks it's time to grapple with the problem. Yeah, yeah. So it comes yeah. before us. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.